In this video, we will prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. This proof is incredibly common to see in more advanced undergraduate math courses like discrete math. If there is ever a course that proves that there are infinitely many primes, you can probably assume that the next exam that you take will ask you to prove that there are infinitely many primes. For that reason, let's prove that there are infinitely many primes together. Hey everyone, real quick, I just wanna mention that this video is a part of a whole course that I made. You can find a link to this entire course in the description below and make sure to click on that subscribe button. Before we address the actual proof itself, let's first address the structure of the proof. To do this, we're going to assume that there are finitely many primes. If it were true that there were finitely many primes, then there shouldn't be any contradictions in mathematics. Yet we will find a contradiction and we'll associate that contradiction to this premise that we assumed that there are finitely many primes which would mean that there are infinitely many primes. All right, with that said, let's prove this. So I'm gonna write first theorem here. Theorem, there are infinitely many primes. Okay, so, Here's the proof. I'm going to break this up into chunks. First, we're going to suppose that there are only finitely many primes. Suppose there are finitely many primes. This is a premise. And note that we're using the word suppose because it's a premise. Okay, two, there must be a largest prime, call it P. If there are finitely many, there has to be a biggest one. So there must be there must be a largest prime. Call it P. This follows from line one because by definition of finitely many, one of them has to be the largest. Three, and this is going to be a little bit, this is the trick of the proof. And for those of you who haven't taken advanced math courses yet, if this is like your first tough math course beyond calculus, and don't get me wrong, calculus can be hard for many students and I understand why. But um, if this is your first co uh, advanced course beyond that, then understand that with proofs, there's typically, uh, at least with the proofs taught in ma these math courses, there's typically a curveball that we throw in here. And this is where that curveball comes in. We're going to let n be p factorial plus 1. Basically, it's just notation, although this is the inspired part of the proof. We're looking at p factorial plus 1. That's the key insight here. 4. n is larger than p. Now, why is that? That's by the definition of p factorial. Um, p factorial is p times p minus 1 times p minus 2, and then plus 1. That number n is much larger than p. 5. N is not divisible by any number less than or equal to P. So N is not divisible by any number less than or equal to P. Now, why is that? Why can we claim that at this point? Well, this is by definition p factorial is divisible by each number less than or equal to p. Let's take a look at that. Look at p factorial. This is p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, 
Uh, so pick any number less than P, less than or equal to P. I guarantee you it's one of the numbers listed here. It's one of the factors specifically of this uh, factorization of P factorial. So that means that P factorial plus one is not divisible by, uh, by any of these numbers here, by P or any number less than P. So if we add one to this, all of these numbers no longer divide that number. So, and, and this is true for like every single number. If you take a number that's divisible by three, say like 123, 123 is divisible by three. If you take that number 123 and add one, it's no longer divisible by three. And that's that works with all numbers, divisible by 17. 34 is divisible by 17. If you add one to 34, it's that number is no longer divisible by 17. So P factorial is divisible by all numbers less than or equal to P. If you add one to that number, all of those numbers no longer divide that number. That's the tricky part of this proof here. All right, step six. The prime factorization of N contains prime numbers greater than P. So the prime number factorization conta uh, contains, so sorry, the, the prime number factorization of N contains prime numbers prime numbers greater than P. I'll put the S in parentheses because N might be a prime number by itself. So uh, the prime number, uh, the prime number factorization of N contains prime numbers greater than P. Why is that? Oh, I don't know why that happened. The reason why that is, is because again, all integers, including n, have a prime factorization. But we know that the prime factorization n has no prime factors that are less than or equal to p because that's what 5 said. And so because of that, it has to contain numbers that are not in the list of finitely many prime numbers. In fact, it has to have um, contain prime numbers greater than p specifically. So since n is divisible by each prime number in the prime factorization of n, and by line five, this must be true. Seven, we're not quite done with our proof yet. So therefore, therefore P is not the largest prime. Now that is because by line six, n is divisible by a prime larger than p, and so p is not the largest prime number. And so finally, to finish our proof, to be very specific here, this is a contradiction. And that's from specifically two and seven, line two and seven, line two, we saw there must be a large prime, largest prime P, but line seven says P is not the largest prime. Those two things cannot be true at the same time. That's a contradiction. And so we, we made a presupposition somewhere in here that must be false. The only presupposition we made here was right there. That suppose, that supposition made a contradiction in mathematics. There cannot be contradictions in mathematics. And so that means that that supposition was wrong. And so there are finitely many primes is false, meaning that there are infinitely many primes. So I'm gonna say, actually gonna write that down here, nine. There are, therefore there are infinitely many primes.
So again, that's from line one and line eight. The contradiction is the um, it contradicts the only premise. And so the premise must be false. We should say a bit more about the last line, though. Up through line eight, we have a valid argument with the premise, there are only finitely many primes. And the conclusion, there is a prime larger than the largest prime. This is a valid argument as each line follows from previous lines. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. However, the conclusion is not true. The only way out, the premise must be false. The sort of line-by-line -line analysis we did here is a great way to really understand what is going on. Whenever you come across a proof in a textbook, you really should make sure you understand what each line is saying and why it is true. Additionally, it is equally, it's equally important to understand the overall structure of the proof. This is where using tools from logic is helpful. Luckily, there are a relatively small number of standard proof styles that keep showing up again and again. Being familiar with these can help understand proof, as well as give ideas of how to write your own. Anyways, thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.